you on Public Exposure. We've come to you from a lot of different places, but this time we're at Scott's Bar and Grill in Edmonds, Washington, and we're talking with one of the best consumer advocates that there ever was, and it's a consumer advocacy show that everybody's going to want to listen to, Howard Bono from My Financial Revival. Howard, welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, My Financial Revival, will you tell me just a little bit about it? Well, what we do basically is we work with people that owe more on their houses than their houses are worth. Uh, which, if you've got a mortgage, if you live in the Puget Sound area and you have a mortgage on your house, chances are about 50-50 that you owe more on that house than your house is worth. And you need some place to go to find out what can you do and what kind of options you've got. And that's really precisely what we do. All right, there's an article out in the, uh, well, it's from uh, MyNorthwest.com, and it's, it says over a third of Seattle area homeowners are still underwater. Now, Underwater, what does that mean? It just means simply that you owe more on your house than your house is worth. Now, you said it was more like 50%. Well, if what the, the article that you're, you're referring to says a third of Seattle or Puget Sound homeowners are upside down. What I'm saying is if you have a mortgage on your house, there's a lot of people that own their houses outright. So if you have a mortgage on your house, um, it, it's about 50-50 whether you're upside really? down. Really? Yes. That high? Yes. And if you, bought, if you took out a mortgage after about 2005, that number is even higher. So essentially then, the problem that we're facing is worse than, than what we're being told. Well, there's a little spin going on trying to make it appear um, maybe not quite as severe as it really is. But the truth is, if you have a mortgage on your house uh, in the Puget Sound area, it's about a 50-50 shot that you owe more on your house than your house is worth. So you've got some choices there. You're going to ride this out. You're going to make some changes. What is it that you're uh, that you're going to do? So what kind of concerns should homeowners have? Um, I mean, if, if they've never had to think about this at all. But, so what kind of concerns should they have, especially you know if they're paying their mortgage on a res- regular basis? Well, the question is. Um, it, several things. Most people are still paying their mortgage on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Now, but there's an awful lot of people that what they're doing is they're having to take money out of savings. They're having to take money out of their retirement accounts just to try to keep that pace up. So the question is going to be, is whatever situation that the individual homeowner is dealing with, income being cut, those kinds of things, is that going to rectify itself before the housing market finishes its collapse or the housing market step starts to come back. So there's all these moving parts that people need to consider in what they're doing. Okay, and there's a giant buzzword right there, before the housing market finishes its collapse. You mean it's not over yet? Oh my goodness, it's not even close to being over. Oh, this is not good news, no. Howard. We have seen housing prices go up a little bit. And let me tell you a little bit about why. Most of the, if you talk to a real estate agent today, they'll tell you that the biggest concern that they have is that there's no inventory. Well, the inventory, the overwhelming majority of inventory that's coming onto the market comes from the banks, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, and and the major banks. So what they've done over the course of the last year is they've cut back the supply. They have millions of houses that they need to sell. They just haven't put them on the market. Why not? Well, several reasons. This was an election year. So is there any influence there to try to make housing prices uh, buoy up a little bit in an election year? I'm going to leave that to our listeners and to you <laughs> to make that call. Okay. Uh, but but there's a noticeable difference in the number of houses that have been put on the market this year. And what it has done is it's created an artificial little mini housing bubble where we've seen housing prices go up. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what they've been able to do is to basically to kind of put out in the news that, hey, housing prices are going up, maybe we're getting close to the bottom. Some people have actually called the bottom of the housing market. We still think that it's at least two years away. How much further are housing prices then realistically likely to go down? We're thinking that we still have at least a 10% drop. Um, They could go more depending on what happens. If we continue with unemployment rates where they are, if we continue with the lack of consumer spending where they are. If we continue with the um, the increased difficulty that, that buyers have in terms of getting a loan to buy a house, mm-hmm. um, we could see them drop further than that. But shouldn't I be encouraged by this settlement, you, um, the Attorney General settlement with the banks? What, is, what does that mean for me? Well, what it means is that the federal government was not able to rein in the banks because the banks were committing, the the big five banks, Mm -hmm. they were committing an awful lot of fraud in the way that they were going about actually foreclosing on houses. They were falsifying documents, 
notarizing yeah. documents they'd never seen, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So the federal government really didn't deal with that issue. Um, as a matter of fact, the federal government went to Bank of America and said, you got a problem here, fix it. They gave Bank of America, 28 days later, Bank of America came back and said, yeah, we found a few, you know, minor things that we were doing, but we've got it all fixed now. The attorneys general around the states said, no, that's not enough, and we need to go in and settle with these big banks on behalf of the consumers of our states. So that settlement agreement was signed about six months ago. $20 billion, the, the large banks had agreed to lower principal to the tune of $20 billion mm -hmm. for homeowners. Now the interesting thing about that $20 billion is anything that the banks forgave in terms of principal in the first year, they get a 25% credit for, which means they're really only giving $17 billion. Mm -hmm. On top of that, if you have a loan that's a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan, you're not going to get any help because they've said no principal reductions. If you have a loan that is um, owned by a, a consortium, a, a mortgage-backed security, mm -hmm. uh, you don't get any help there. So what the banks did is they went back in and they started um, forgiving debt primarily on their own second mortgages. So if you had a second mortgage through Bank of America, Wells, Chase, uh, GMAC, those people, then you had a chance of getting a, uh, a principal forgiveness on your second mortgage. But here's the kicker. You had to already be behind by a minimum of three months before you were even considered in the pool for eligibility. So for those people that have been paying their debts the whole time, they're out. They weren't even considered for, for eligibility. So is, is that is that what you, you mean on your website when you say big banks don't want uh, uh, don't want you to know some of the things that you're about to tell us? Well, that's one of the things that they don't want you to You mean there's even know. more? Oh my goodness, there's so much more. For well, let's hear some For example, it. in the state of Washington, if you have one loan on your house, the banks want you to believe that they will destroy your financial world if you don't continue to make the payments. The truth is, if you decide that you're going to not make payments on your house, you can live in your house, we can safely say about a year without making a payment on it. The bank would foreclose on it, but the state statute also says that the banks have no eligibility, no rights ever to come back after you for any of the money they lose. Well, wait a minute. Help, help me understand this. If I borrow money that's secured by my house, if I borrow $500,000 that's secured by my house, right. and I've, I've paid it down to where the principal that's owed is $425,000, uh, if, uh, if it's foreclosed on, somebody comes in and buys it for three seventy-five. dollars there's $50,000 left, the bank can't come after me for that? No. Really? No. Now, there is some differences and there's yeah. some nuances. As we mentioned earlier, there's lots and lots of moving parts in this. Yeah, okay. If you let your house go to foreclosure, for example, you're going to have a foreclosure on your credit report mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Interestingly enough, though, um, if you went to that full extreme and lived in your house free for a year or a year and a half or however long, and you had a foreclosure on your record, you can buy another house three years later. It only takes three. People think it's like seven or ten or I'm out forever. No, mm -hmm. no, no. It's only three. And so, let's say you bought a house for five hundred thousand. You yeah. financed four fifty, yeah. and today that house is worth three fifty, and you still owe four fifty on it. You could walk away from that. Not uh, walk away is a bad term. You could live there for a, an extended period of time without making payments on it. The bank could foreclose on that property, but they can never come back after you for any of the money they've lost. You're out. You're out. So it's, it's kind of like um, a private bankruptcy then, isn't it? But it only relates to one? It all, it's, is that, it, is it's that all, right? Yeah, it, it basically disperses that debt. The bank cannot come back after you. The, you might have some tax issues because the IRS says if the bank loses 100000 on that house, that the IRS looks at that as a gift from the bank. So it's potential. Are you kidding me? No, no. That's no. one of the dumbest things I've ever Adding heard. Adding insult to injury. Um, Again, going back to the number of moving parts, there is a law in place that says if it's your primary residence and that happens, you don't have to pay tax on that money. But that law expires at the end of 2012. So now we're anxiously awaiting Congress to oh, see if they'll okay. extend that law. So, um, and then there's some other there's some other possible outs. So is this part of the fiscal cliff that, that we keep hearing about? No, this, this isn't. The fiscal cliff has to do with spending and has to do with um, uh, tax, you know, revenue yeah. increases, to use their mm -hmm. code word. You know, more yeah. taxes versus spending and yeah. those kinds of things. Well, if I'm a bank, though, I don't, I don't want this law to be extended. 
Well, the banks, I don't know, that really care. Because, yes, it would be another hammer that they could use to say, look, you're going to have this big tax debt. But the banks themselves aren't going to get any more or any less money, whether that law gets extended or whether that law doesn't get extended. It simply is a protection for homeowners from the IRS. You know, and I don't know about you, but I would rather have Chase Bank chasing me for 100000 than the IRS chasing me for twenty. There's something really interesting on the website, uh, the MyFinancialRevival.com, that I just had to ask you about. And the headline is this. It's from September 21st, 2012. If banks have agreed to forgive debt, shouldn't they do it for people who are still alive? <laughs> what was that? Man? That's an actual story. Now, we talked just a minute ago about the Attorney's General settlement, uh -huh. where the banks have to forgive $20 billion in in debt. They have a three-year yeah, window. That, that, that's to do across it. the United States. That's across the United States, with the exception of Oklahoma, because they opted out. 49 attorneys general oh, settled that. Oklahoma opted out. Um, so the banks have to forgive. They can't forgive Fannie and Freddie loans because Fannie and Freddie say no. They can't forgive um, mortgage-backed security loans because many of them, they don't even know who owns them to be able yes. to ask if it's okay. Okay, so, I got to stop you right there because you say they don't even know who owns them. In truth, they really do. They just they don't want to look. Is that is that not really accurate? True. You know, if you ask in their files who owns it, they don't really know. Can they track it down relatively quickly? Yes. And that's the MERS group, right? Well, it, MERS is uh, a whole nother aspect of it. MERS was simply a, a corporation that the big banks devised so they could transfer loans around to each other without paying the uh, excise tax that many counties in the country require to be paid every time a loan is transferred. Mm -hmm. So that was simply a shell game that the banks did to um, to eliminate having to pay county taxes. You know, I'm wanting to play this song, We Won't Get Fooled Again, but I know that we will. Well, oh, absolutely. Every time, in my opinion, every time the government gets involved in trying to negotiate with these bankers, mm -hmm. they get out negotiated. These bankers are slick, they're smart, they have just huge, huge teams of attorneys and tax people, and they're so far ahead in in developing these financial tools mm -hmm. that the government, it, with the limited resources the government has, simply can't keep up. Yeah, and you know, I interrupted you because you were telling the story of this headline, if people, uh, if banks have agreed to forgive debt, shouldn't they do it for people who are still alive? I'm going to tell you, a, a, this is a true story. We have a client that we've been working with since um, the end of 2011. This gentleman died in um, uh, early 20, excuse me, the end of 2010. He died in early 2011, mm -hmm. February. He and his wife were living in this house and um, they had a big second mortgage on it. Um, she's not on the mortgage, she's not on the title. So really, when he passed, that house is in probate and the banks, of course, aren't going to get any money. They forgave 111000 Bank of America forgave an $111,000 second mortgage in part of the Attorney's General settlement. And the Attorney's General settlement was signed well more than a year later after this gentleman died. <laughs> so they were never going to collect a nickel on this anyway. But what they did was they forgave this $111,000 second mortgage. And they're taking 125% credit towards the um, uh, towards the total settlement, so they're getting extra credit for it. And we've been told that uh, in addition to the extra credit they get, that they also get multiples in terms of tax write-offs when they forgive debt. Now this was a debt they were never going to get a nickel on mm -hmm. because this gentleman passed you know, a, a long time beforehand. And we've heard multiple stories. This is just one that was hit close to home because we know all the players and we know the actual story. Oh, wow. And on the other part of the actual story is that whenever there is a tax write-off that is given to a bank, that's actually a public subsidy of banks, isn't Correct. it? Correct. Okay. Correct. Because the banks, are, they're, they're making plenty of profits. Mm -hmm. So we've heard some in some cases, and I, we haven't been able to verify this, but we've heard that they get multiples in tax write-offs. So if they take you know, in this case, $111,000 write-off. They actually get 135000 in credit towards the settlement, but we hear that they might get two or three times that 111000 in an actual tax write-off. So if you're working with a client who comes to you and says, I'm underwater, you know, and I'm underwater by uh, by 25 percent, at least 25 percent of, of, uh, of the amount of the value of the house, mm -hmm. what do you tell them? 
Well, the way our program works is we start with a free 15-minute phone consultation. Mm -hmm. so, so people can still remain relatively anonymous. And the goal of the phone consultation is simply to be able to answer their immediate questions. Everybody's got something that's nagging at them that, that stops them from sleeping at night. So we want to help them to, to overcome those things by getting clear, definitive answers. Then the next step, we, we bring them in for a 90-minute consultation. We do a little homework. We want to know how much they make, how much they owe, how they're surviving now and how they're doing, and what their long-term goals are. And then we go through all nine of the options that people have available. Now that's everything from stay and keep paying on your house just the way that you've been doing, um, all the way down to quit paying it and file bankruptcy. So, and there's every step in between, all the different government programs, all the different things that, that the, little, the little pieces of the puzzle that people might already have, what we want to help them to do is to have all of the pieces and, most importantly, the picture on the outside of the puzzle box mm -hmm. so that they know what the puzzle looks like when it's all put together. And let them choose basically what's in their best interest as opposed to what road somebody else might be leading them down. Well, also on your website, the FAQs. Real important on any website, for, you know, frequently asked questions. And we're going to put them up on the screen and we don't have time to go through all of them. But this essentially, you know, can I go to jail if I don't pay my mortgage? Is that, do people really ask that these days? You'd be surprised. I get asked that question probably at least once a week. You know, you're, and, and when we sit down with people and we're going through and saying, you can do this, you can do that, you can do this, here's the way the banks operate, here's how we throw a wrench in that gear, right? Mm -hmm. So people would say, can I go to jail for this? Because people are honorable. You know, people that own, have, everybody I believe for the most part is honorable. They, they don't know. Are banks honorable? No. no. Wow. Uh, plainly. I mean, I can show you things that the banks do. Um, are they dishonorable because they are so disorganized? Are they dishonorable because they are businesses? Businesses aren't required to have honor or morals. Businesses are required to make a profit. So is it because of that? Do they operate under different rules than we do? I'd say that's probably a fair statement. You're a business. I'm a business, correct. Um, but I'm a small business. I am, I am on a mission here because, you know, I lost an awful lot of money in the, and I think this, this collapse of the housing market was orchestrated. The more research I do, the more I believe it was orchestrated. Really? So, yeah. And I've lost so much money that it's my mission now that I'm going to make sure that, um, that, that the public gets a hundred times back what I lost. Okay, that's probably a dumb question. I've asked them before. Who wins in the orchestration of the collapse of the housing market? Well, let's look at it this way. We've seen, this is just one of the things that, that's come to my mind. We've seen for the last couple of decades where businesses are constantly harping on the fact that they need to lower their labor costs. Would you agree? Yeah. You know, so that they can compete in the global market. That's uh -huh. what they've been trying to do. We're seeing an awful lot of pressure on unions at this point, and that is the reason behind it. They're saying, got to get labor costs down. The truth is, what I see is, I mean, if you go to work at Boeing today, you're going to make not $30 an hour, about $14, right? They want people wow. working for $12 to $15 an hour. Businesses in general, I'm not saying Boeing, I'm just saying businesses in general want people working for $12 to $15 an hour. Huge, huge pressure on pushing down hourly rates for workers. If a starter house is $300,000, people won't do it. They'll move, they'll go someplace else, they'll, they'll figure something else out. If a starter house is $125,000, people could afford to work for $12 or $14 an hour and still be able to, be able to buy a house. Mm. So if, if businesses and banks can push the housing values down to those levels and they don't have to pay for it, they win. Wow. So that's just one of the reasons, and I, I think it's orchestrated. Another section on your website is testimonials, and there's, there's quite a few testimonials, but one of them kind of sticks out, and we're actually going to put part of it up on the screen, we're going to make sure that we, we block out the name of the person, because we don't want to do anything there. But this is a, a, a gentleman who says, I lost my wife of 27 years suddenly, and aside from the grief, I was left with a huge hole in our family income, and three kids to take care of. We, were, we got used to eating rice and beans. You know, and the rest of the story we'll let you read for yourself. But what happened? I mean, it, if he's a testimonial, there's some, there's a, a, a rainbow at the end of this story. There is. And this guy, um, what happened was his, all of this is an absolute true story. Um, 
tw wife of 27 years, ran a daycare center out of their house. And they were, she was making sixty to $80,000 a year running this daycare center out of their house. Mm -hmm. And she passed. It was sudden. It was sudden. So not only did he have to deal with shutting down her business, but the, also the immediate stoppage of all of that income. His income simply wasn't enough, and he had three kids that he was raising. Mm -hmm. So, of course, daycare wasn't an issue because mom ran the daycare. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, mom so ran the daycare. So there's an awful lot there that was going on. So what he did was he started cutting his expenses back dramatically. He started selling assets. You know, he had a motorcycle, and they had you know extra cars and that kind of thing. So he started selling those assets off, trying to continue to make his house payments. Mm -hmm. And and when those um, and assets had been sold off and used to make house payments and he spent all of his savings he contacted his bank which is what we're told to do and you know the bank said well you don't qualify for a loan modification because you don't make enough money so you need to go talk to a housing counselor so he went and talked to the housing counselor followed all the rules from the bank and the housing counselor basically said you can't afford this house you're gonna have to do something else and at that point, he was really at the end of his rope. He heard one of our ads on the radio and called us, and we laid out for him a program where he could live in that house for free for the time that he, for as long as he could, basically, and um, use that money to kind of reestablish his family, reset a new ground zero for what he's going to be able to, the, the way they're going to be able to live based on his income. But he had that period of time that he could do it without making a house payment. So we gave him that reprieve that he needed to, to kind of come together with his kids and say, this is the way that we're going to be living now. It's going to be a little bit different, but we're going, to, we're going to tighten up as a family and make that happen. So he lived in his house for more than a year without making a payment. The bank finally did come foreclose on it, which is okay with him because he couldn't afford it anyway. And um, we, uh, we made sure that he didn't have any tax issues. So he doesn't have any, so basically he walked away with damaged credit mm -hmm. and he and his kids went and rented another house, coincidentally in the same neighborhood that they were living in. And so he rented another house that he could afford. And so now they've reset. They can live comfortably on the income that he makes. Mm -hmm. They've come together as a family, but they got that, that break for that year or so to, in order to be able to do that. And basically we walked him through that process of how to go about that without having to worry about the banks coming after him or any of those kinds of things. Hmm. Is that, well, do you have an average story? No. You know, originally when we started, this, when I started this company, I wanted to create a kit and sell it on the internet. Mm -hmm. Because I thought that that would be easier. People didn't want to talk openly about this issue. And what I found is that every single person that we deal with is different. I don't have two clients that are even close to being the same. They have different issues. Um, so that's why we do our 90 minute consultation. That's why we do the free 15 minute uh, upfront phone consultation because everybody is different. Everybody requires an awful lot of hand holding because the banks are very sophisticated in the way that they deal with you. Mm -hmm. Do you negotiate directly with a bank on we're, behalf of the... Yeah, we're not allowed to do that simply because um, we're not attorneys. Mm -hmm. So we know what to say, even more so than most attorneys, sure. but we're not allowed to do that. And the truth is, we're counseling most of our clients not to really spend much time talking with the banks. Why is that? Because the only thing the banks are interested in is they want to know, they want complete updated financials from you so they know how they can come back after you. They know where the bodies are buried, so to speak. They know where your income comes from. They know where you keep it. They know how much is there. That's why they want all this information. And so for most people, the individual conversation with the bank is not pleasant. Yeah. So that affects them for a period of time. And um, the bank is only after things that are going to help the bank to further be aggressive against that particular client. Mm -hmm. And for most people, they don't need it or they, they don't want it. Mm -hmm. um, they want you, to know what's possible. You do have other, um, you have bankruptcy attorneys, you have financial counselors, real estate professionals, tax specialists. You have all of those that are part, though, of your services, right? Correct. We're the financial revival group. And it's because no single one of those, pe those attorneys, uh, uh, real estate agents, CPAs, financial advisors, insurance advisors, family counselors, nobody, no one group can handle the, the wide spectrum 
of issues that are developed in this process. So what we did was we said, let's determine what an individual really needs, and then let's make sure that we have the experts that we can send those people to immediately to get that morsel, that piece of the total puzzle fixed. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we have bankruptcy attorneys, we have real estate attorneys. Um, we, we have a, a, just a pretty wide range, and then we can tell these people, look, you need to spend some time with this person to be able to help. So if I were to ask you the question, uh, what does success mean if I'm one of your clients, and your answer would have to be, it depends, right? Exactly. It's like, what do you want success to look like? If you want to keep your house, you know, um, we've got people that say, I've got a big second mortgage, I want to get out of the second mortgage and keep my house. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one thing. I have other people that say, you know, look, I've got a whole bunch of other credit card debt. You know, and I'm not working now. So success for me would be to live in my house free for the next two years, get rid of all of that debt, you know, and then be able to move on. Completely different scenario. So um, that's why we have to, uh, our job is pretty labor intensive. Really? Because we really do have to do an awful lot of counseling type work um, to help people to understand, yes, you can get to where you want to go. It, it may not be pretty, and it may not be the, the path that you thought you were going to have to take, uh, but we can help you to get there. And we have viewers in lots of different places, um, not just in King County, but uh, what, what areas do you work in? I've got clients all over the state. Really? Really, all over the state. I've got a big cluster in Cleelum, um, Puyallup, Gig Harbor, Tacoma, Olympia, Maple Valley, Marysville, Everett. Um, there's clusters around, and in spots that you may not be think that there would be clusters. Um, but we operate all over the state. You know, We have a meeting once a month for our ongoing members, and currently we're doing meetings in Arlington, Bellevue, and Federal Way. And then our next meeting that we'll be opening up, looks like it's probably gonna be Olympia. Really? So um, once a month we bring our members together so they get a chance to talk to each other. We've got less than 30 seconds, but can government help? Government, I think, missed the window. I think they missed the window to help. The programs that have been put out now are now in their second iteration. We have HAMP 2, we have HARP 2.0, so we have different iterations of those programs, but really they can't help because all the government programs that have been put out were really designed to protect the banks, not the homeowner. Howard, thank you very much for being with us. We gotta go. Truly a pleasure to be here, Stan. It's been Howard Bono of My Financial Revival, and we're coming to you again from Scott's Bar and Grill in Edmonds, Washington. We thank them very much for their hospitality. If you have some uh, financial issues, especially related to your house, go check it out. We'll see you next time right here on Public Exposure. Take care.